Hello, everybody. This is Jay Papazan. Um, welcome to our One Thing seminar. So excited to have you with our special guest, Greg McCown. Um, today, um, the way we're going to work it out today, I will give you a quick introduction um, to Greg, our special guest. I will work through just a couple of slides so that y'all, if you're new to the book and in our surveys, about 30% of the folks who show up every month are new to the book, I'll give you just the big ideas. Take about five minutes, just so if I start talking about dominoes, you'll know why I'm talking about dominoes with Greg. And then I'll introduce Greg and you, he and I will have a conversation about how our books work together and hopefully you'll learn a little bit about why essentialism uh, the discipline, Disciplined Pursuit of Less is such a great compliment to the one thing and one of those books that, for me, just keeps showing up um, in a good, positive way around our work. So a little bit about Greg. Um, I'm super excited. I've been hearing about Greg since, I guess it would have been spring of last year when he spoke at South by Southwest here in Austin. One of my coworkers came in and said, man, you've really got to check this book out. Um, he told me about the speech and how electric it was and how cool the ideas and how in alignment they were with what we've been preaching. And I immediately went on Amazon and purchased the book. So here's just, I mean, a very short but comprehensive bio on some of the things that Greg has accomplished. Um, he's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less, obviously. His writing has appeared and been covered in Fast Company. Fortune, The Huffington Post, Politico, Inc. Magazine, and Harvard Business Review. He's also been interviewed on all kinds of television, including NPR and NBC. He's the CEO of This Inc., and his clients are just an all-star list. Adobe, Apple, Airbnb, Google, Facebook, Pixar, Salesforce.com, Symitech, Twitter, VMware, and Yahoo. I mean, literally an A to Y, almost Z. I'll, we'll have to ask him to get a Z client that's that prestigious. Um, he's an accomplished public speaker. We'll get to hear that today. He's spoken to audiences around the world, Australia, Bulgaria, Canada, China, you name it, Norway, Singapore, United States. Um, his highlights are the South by Southwest speech that I told you about before. He's interviewed Al Gore at the annual conference of World Economic Forum. And gosh, he's gotten to speak at the invocation conference um, in Norway. He's just pretty much done it all in terms of public speaking. He was also in 2012 named the Young Global Leader by the World Economic Forum, and that's just pretty darn cool. Um, he's originally from London, England. He now lives in Silicon Valley with his wife and their four children, and he graduated with an MBA from Stanford University. So I'm a little bit breathless um, in more ways than one. We've got a really special guest today. Um, I'm super excited um, to chat about that. So really quickly, let me get some of the, the housekeeping out of the way before we bring Greg on. First off, um, like I said, I'll cover a little bit about our book before we switch gears and have our Q&A. Throughout this session, if you will use the questions bar on your screen, you can at, answer questions, um, ask us questions, which we will get to at the end of the broadcast. Um, at the end of our conversation, I'll kind of be watching the clock. I'll leave about 15 or 20 minutes. And then we'll turn it over and we'll start taking your questions. It's like Rob. Rob's all over it. He already suggested Zappos as Greg's next client if they aren't already his client. So he'd have his A to Z. Way to go, Rob. So use that questions bar. We're monitoring it throughout. You can let us know if there's a problem um, and we will cover it. And we'll also save your questions for the end. So use that questions bar. Um, also, uh, gosh, I guess that's about it. Let me just get the, the basics out of the way here. Um, the one thing. So if you're new to the one thing, we built the book on, on this very old uh, principle. It's tried and true, the 80-20 principle. And lots and lots of research backs this, especially lots of business experience, which is why a lot of entrepreneurs are so attracted to it. The 80-20 principle essentially says you get the majority of your results from the minority of what you do. A lot of times this shows up as 20% of your effort yields 80% of your results. Um, Gary likes to say that, you know, we believe in the laws of the physical world, like gravity, right? You drop your pencil, you see it hit the floor, you can see gravity at work. The 80-20 principle is just as real in the world of business, yet people for some reason don't treat it that way. And we hope that after exposure to Greg's message and ours, you'll start looking at it a little bit differently, that there is an essential thing that you can do in everything that you pursue. What we hope people will do and obtain by narrowing their focus is what we call a domino progression, right? 
there's this idea that if you line up your dominoes correctly, you can knock over one and get them all to fall down. And it's the central metaphor in our book. It's the idea that we're acknowledging that there's never just one thing, right? We have our kids, we have our job, we have our extracurricular activities. But if you're conscious of where you're going and why you're doing things, you can make a conscious effort to line them up so that you get the most from the time you do spend on doing the things that you love doing. And in some of our research, which was just frankly kind of fun, um, we found a guy who would you know, set the world record in the Netherlands. They've actually lined up almost 5 million dominoes and gotten them all to fall down by just knocking over one. So there's a tremendous possibilities when you start lining these up. It can go farther than most people would imagine. And one of the cooler things was in the American Journal of Physics, a guy named Lorne Whitehead discovered that a two inch domino can knock over a three inch domino and a three inch domino can knock over a four and a half inch domino. A domino in essence can knock over one that's 50% larger. And we asked the question, if you could build those, he built them physically up to about nine. If you could build them beyond the laws of physics, how big would they get? And with just 18 dominoes into the run, it would be taller than the Tower of Pisa. 23 in, it would be higher than the Eiffel Tower. 31 dominoes from that two inch domino and you would be knocking over a domino that was 3000 feet above Everest. And what kind of blows the mind is just 57 dominoes into it. I think that's less than two sets. You would have a domino almost the distance from the earth to the moon. And it all started with just a two inch domino. And that's what we want people to harness in their lives by identifying their one thing. And in business, it usually is one thing, right? It's a, it's a mantra for your company. It's a solid service or product that leads all others and you need to prioritize it. Prioritize it. Over time, we believe in our personal and professional lives, people can achieve this geometric progression. And here's the final thought and really the basis for this series. We ask the question, if you knew your one thing, why wouldn't you form a habit, right? Why would you take discipline out of the equation? Because we know and research backs this up that if you work for a habit, the habit will work for you. So the idea being when you know your one thing, turn it into a habit that you do every single day It's because that takes less and less effort. It's just like in the beginning, we had to fight with our parents, right, to brush our teeth. But over time, it became ingrained and all the other little things that we do. Well, the biggest successes in life actually take bigger things like practice for a violinist, right? Um, you read about Warren and Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, they spend like six hours a day studying and reading, right? They need knowledge to make great investments. You figure out your one thing and you make that thing a regular habit. And in our research, on average, it forms in 66 days. So the purpose of these webinars was hopefully, and it's kind of my job when it's not explicitly set out to do it, hopefully we'll identify one thing today with Greg from his book that you could file away and say, you know what? that would be an awesome habit for me to form in my life. If I started doing that unconsciously, I would be a better person, a better professional, whatever it is. And we can add that to the list because the best people in life are just acquiring one habit after another, and it's actually piling it on, right? You really become almost superhuman in the end because people have become these just kind of all this momentum behind their powerful habits. So those are the big ideas behind the one thing. That's the you know, the two and a half minute elevator speech, but that also sets the stage in case in our dialogue, we start going there. And right now I'd like to bring Greg onto the line. Greg, if you can unmute and join us and just let us know that you hear us, we'd love to have you join us. Oh, uh, it's just great to be with you. I'm, being, I'm feeling inspired after having heard that, uh, that introduction from you. <laughs> awesome. I can't tell you how thrilled I am. I mean, I don't know about you as an author, but especially in the first days and months after a book comes out, maybe a little bit obsessively going to Amazon and looking at the reviews and stuff. And that became a bit of a habit, right? And over time, and I remember when your book came out within about a month, there was always the better together feature, like the, the great, you know, minds at Amazon, their algorithm started pairing our books almost immediately. And they're still there. Almost about half the time I click on it, I'll see bought frequently bought together the one thing and essentialism. So I'm I'm super happy to formally introduce you um, to a lot of folks who are been fans of the one thing and are trying to implement it in their lives. So welcome to the show. 
Thank you ever so much. It's great to be with you, Jay. Well, why don't we start by um, telling folks a little bit, how did you come to write a book, Essentialism? Like, what was the thing that sparked this journey? Because I know writing a book is a lot of effort and work. What, what, where was your starting point with this? Well, you know, it all really started actually 16 years ago. And uh, 16 years ago, I was staring at a piece of paper in my hand with all of these answers, all these scribbles and, uh, and so on. And I'd spent the last 20 minutes brainstorming a simple question, which is what would you do if you could do anything? Hmm. And what I noticed when I was finished with that list was not what was on the list, but what was not on the list. <laughs> uh, law, school, law school was not on the list. Um, and, and this turned out to be a bit of a problem because I was at the time at law school. That's right. And so, uh, you know, what do you do about that? And I, uh, you know, I concluded that I, I was actually visiting in the U.S. at the time, and I was away from my, uh, you know, away from law school, I was away from, from the U.K. And I thought I'd better call my parents, and so I called the 15-digit number back to England, and my, uh, you know, my mother answers, fortunately, and uh, and she says, well, she listens for a while, and then she says, look, I think you better talk to Dad. Uh, and so then he comes on the phone, and. You know, basically, he had shared one message with me my whole life, which was, you know, keep your options open. That's what you needed. You take education so you have lots of options. And, of course, there's some wisdom in that. Mm -hmm. And he listens to me for a while, and he says, uh, he says well, actually, I'm going to pause for a second. Jay, what advice will you give me? Uh, you, can be, you can play my dad for a moment. You get this call from your son after all this time, all this money, all this effort. Right. Now, well, you know. What are you going to say? Really? What are you going to say, Jay? Greg, aren't you going to finish what you started? You know, you've already invested this time and energy. Why don't you just conclude it? And if you want to do something else, you can. Uh, well, that seems like sound advice, Dad. Um, but uh, what, if, what if I'm just going in the, the wrong way? Hmm. Uh, won't I just get lost faster if I keep going down this path? <sighs> What keeps going through my mind, Greg, would be, but how are you going to pay for your college debt if you don't become a lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and, and, and actually that's interesting, right? I mean, now we're just ripping on this, but but I frequently will ask people, you know, what what is it that you really would, would do if you could do anything? You know, what is your highest point of contribution in your life? Right. And And, and when I ask people, what I'm struck by, is that at first they just don't know the answer. That's the first thing I'm struck by. They really just, it creates a sort of blankness that I think is, uh, that I think people are so concerned about, so afraid of in a way, that they, that they don't want to admit it. In fact, it's, come, it's, it's helped me come to this conclusion that I think there's only two kinds of people in the world. Okay. There are, mm. there are people who are lost, and there are people who know that they are lost. <laughs> oh yeah. And okay. and and this is this is a non-trivial point here as we launch into this conversation that that when we admit we're lost. Well, actually, I was talking about my father. Let's just stay on this for a moment. So my father was one of these. That when when he would you know we'd go you know driving somewhere, he, he would get lost. Right. And and I'm sure I'm, my father's not the only father of those that are on the call today who wouldn't stop to ask for directions. You wouldn't admit they were lost. And the thing about that that's funny is that if, as soon as you have the courage, the humility, whatever the combination is to go, look, I'm lost, actually that very moment you know what to do. Right? You stop, you ask for directions, you get the map out. You know the fix. The problem is not admitting the problem in the first place. That's the real problem. And so, uh, you know, I suppose with me at law school, I always knew while I was there, this isn't what I want to do. This isn't it. I could sense that every day. But somehow being committed to it, being part of it, I, I sort of felt like I've just got to keep going. And after all, if I do this, it keeps my options open. So this is where we are in the conversation with my dad. You and know, so I, he says to me, he says this, he says, he says, he says, you know what I've always told you? And remember, I've got in my mind a mental model of what he's going to tell me, keep your options open. He says that he says because all Englishmen, you know, quote Shakespeare over <laughs> tea and crumpets for <laughs> breakfast in the morning. 
Uh, he pulls out a line from Hamlet. He says, to thine own self be true. Well, you know, all right, Dad, he'd never said that to me in his whole life. But, uh, but he pulls it out in this moment that it matters. And, and really, in that story is the beginning seeds of what follows. Uh, that there's two different ethics that are being described there. Keep your options open, right? Meaning, you know, try and try and do all sorts of things so that you can do whatever you want to do later. That's fine, but that's one ethic. It's a sort of, sort of an overvaluing of optionality. Yes. And then there's another side to this, which is look, do the right few things at the right time for the right reasons. That's a very different path. So there's two paths there, and the seeds in that story for what followed. But, uh, but let me just share one more thing, and then we'll, we'll take it wherever you'd like to go. Yeah. What was on the piece of paper was a question. Mm -hmm. And it was a question that I have pursued now for these now almost 16 years. And the question was, why is it otherwise successful people and companies don't break through to the next level? And that was the question. And, uh, and that, to me, that's non-trivial. Uh, no. Because if you and I were to have a race, right, Jay, if you and I had a race and you won, which you're, you're almost certainly going to do, <laughs> um, then, then, and then we have a second race. You and I have a second race. Now, you start the second race with the advantage you ended the last one with, meaning you start 10 yards ahead Okay. in the second race. Now, Jay, what is the percentage chance that you're going to win? Um, theoretically, it's going to be hugely high, close to 100%, because if I won the first race okay. and I have a 10-yard lead, how could I lose, right? Jay, Jay, Jay that's a little bit rude. <laughs> Unless you've no, got a lasso no, no. and you're going to trip me, right? Of course, no, but it's cause you, of course it's 100%. And then if we race the third time, now you start with a 20-yard race in the third race, 20-yard lead, what is the chance you're going to win again? 100%. Right. And yet, what we find when you look at the research, when you follow companies, when you follow the story of successful people, you find that that is not what happens. That they don't simply take the next level. They don't break through to the next level. My question was why. So, um, Is that a lack of yeah. clarity? Is that because they don't know they're lost or that they've suddenly become lost and didn't realize it? Like your original, there are two kinds of people. Where do those companies fall in? They're a leader until suddenly they're not. They lose their lead. Yeah. Well, let me let me put that into uh, you know, perspective here. What what I noticed was working with Silicon Valley companies um, and, and working with executive teams. What I noticed was that when they were focused on the right two things at the right time, you know, that led to success. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to see why because. They're able to build momentum because of the same domino metaphor you just used. They've got things moving and it's going in the right direction. And, 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 and so, therefore, they're able to move forward. But here's the trick, is that when they are successful, something else also comes. And what also comes is options and opportunity. There we go. And it muddies everything up that, again. That, well, that, exactly so. I mean, of course, that's the, that sounds like the right problem to have. And, uh, you know, and it probably is the right problem to have, but it, it, it does turn out, in fact, to be a problem if it leads to what Jim Collins calls uh, the undisciplined pursuit of more. Right. And, and, and the undisciplined pursuit of more is something we notice all over the place, uh, but it, it's, you know, maybe exaggerating the point in order to make it here. Uh, if well, you fall into the undisciplined pursuit of more, then success can become a catalyst for failure. Uh, we see it all the time. I can't remember it was, yeah. uh, the the I, I can't remember what the principle was called, but like you'd see people who were killing it at a job, and then they would immediately get promoted beyond their competency, and one or two promotions later, they had this star record. And somehow they get promoted beyond their competency. And in all the things that they are having to do, the thing that really made them so great is, is no longer shining so bright. And I think that, you know, you see companies diversify, right, based on their private success. I think we do that on a personal and at a business level. I've seen that pattern play out. And that was one of the, the cooler threads through your book. 
Um, I don't read a lot of business books from, from end to end. I did yours and I underlined it just like crazy, but that came up at least three times how there, there's a two-edged sword to success. Um, I like the way you put it this time. You know, the opening of doors can kind of muddy the waters. It can cloud your clarity and that, that has a high price. Let's talk about, you used, oh, go ahead. Well, no, I just was, uh, I was really just going to sort of, uh, to, to agree mm -hmm. with that and, uh, and riff on that. That, that, that of course, uh, my point of view, the, the book as well, it, it's not arguing, um, uh, you know, success is not a bad thing, clearly. Right. Uh, but what we have to learn is how to be successful at success. <laughs> uh, and, and, and to not do that only once, uh, but to continually expand our ability to be successful at success. It's a, it's a, uh, it, it's, you know, basically the moment we stop developing this capability, we will plateau in our progress. So, so we, it, it, you know, someone can someone can continue to be fairly successful at their current level just by continuing to do the things that they're doing. Uh, but in order to break through to the next level, you, you have to apply different principles. You have to, and, and that really is what, uh, what the book is about. And that's that, that evolution. Um, you know, one of the things that Gary says that, and I'll just, there'll be the last riff. And then I want to, I want to turn to the next slide where we can kind of look at kind of the three steps you have to, you know, the pursuit of less. But one of the things people will say, like he'll describe his day and how much time he spends on his one thing and the focus he gives the things that matters the most. And people almost always want to point to a successful person and say, well, you get to do that because you're you. And his thing that he always says almost invariably is, no, I got to be here because I acted that way before I'd earned the right to do it. And I think yeah, there is an not, approach. Not the cause and effect wrong there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I do think um, that that's something that if people can kind of take some of your ideas to heart, and they were definitely in our book too. That's where we just are so in alignment about getting better clarity. Um, and I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna really quiz you hard after you give your big model because I want to talk about you know you have a great model for saying yes. You have some great models for saying no. You have some really cool ideas about what happens when people don't have clarity. And I'm, I want to dive in a little deeper. So if you don't mind, I would, I'm, I'm turning the page and I'm not sure um, if you, where you are, you can see it, but basically we've got your central model. You know, you've got the discipline pursuit of less. I think it's on page 26 of your book, if I remember. It's explore, eliminate, and execute. At a really high yeah. level, can you just kind of give us, what's the 30,000 foot view of essentialism so people know the framework yeah. that you're working with? Yes, well, well, look, the essentialism is a shorter word for the disciplined pursuit of less but better. So if the problem is the undisciplined pursuit of more, then the antidote is the disciplined pursuit of less but better. And that breaks down to these sort of three key capabilities. The first is to create enough space to be able to ask and answer the question, what is essential? The second is once you now have identified what really is essential, it's to have uh, the, the grace and the wisdom to be able to thoughtfully eliminate the non-essentials mm -hmm. and therefore to then reallocate the resources that you've saved because you're not now still investing in them uh, to, to make execution of what is most important as effortless as possible. So those are the, the three big disciplines. Uh, and first is to explore what is essential. Second is to eliminate what's not essential. And the third is to make it as effortless as possible to, uh, to accomplish what you've identified as being the most important. So that's really the, the, the thing, the, the conceptual uh, three pieces that somebody has to become really good at in order to over time, not treat this subject as one more thing to stuff into our already overstuffed lives, uh, but in fact to become a different kind of leader, to become an essentialist. 
Um, I love the simplicity of it. I can remember that, explore, eliminate, execute. I can then, you know, it, it answers the question when people talk about the 80-20 principle or the one thing. You know, it's like one of the ways of, well, what does that actually look like? Well, you've got to get space. And I'd like to explore that here, you know, about how to ask and, and decide what that important thing is. Then you have to actually get rid of the other stuff. You have to say no to some stuff so that you can really say yes. So can you just go to right now, explore, finding space to ask. I, when you were talking about people who were lost and didn't know it, I, I always go back to like living in Paris way back when. And a friend of mine who said, there's so much that we do. And this is great, you know, Parisian postgraduate, you know, existential angst stuff, right? But he's like, it's the pain of being. Everybody's doing all this stuff to avoid having to look inside for one minute and ask, why am I here? Because it's a scary question. And it can be a big question or a small question. Like you could walk into a business and you have stories of asking people, what are you doing here? Like, what is your role here? And the lack of clarity, um, it can be devastating. And I think you even described it as learned helplessness. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? Well, yes. I mean, let's let's just talk about, you know, let's start with, uh, I was at Twitter recently and one of the leaders said to me, uh, or asked the question rather, uh, do you remember what it was like to be bored? <laughs> uh, on the basis, well, it's a bit ironic, isn't it, really, given that they were the ones that did it to us. Uh, but, but, you know, regardless of what anybody else is doing right now, yeah, even if they are, in fact, not multitasking this second, and they are actually paying attention to this conversation, <laughs> then the next thing that everybody on the call is going to do is to check their phone. Right. Right. Like whatever we do first, that's what we do next. And so, you know, social media, smartphones, these didn't start the fire of non-essentialism. Right. The problem existed uh, before that. But these have accelerated the challenge at hand because basically now the space never just happens for people. Right. You, you, you never just find yourself going, well, my goodness, I've got three hours and, and nobody's going to contact me and I'm not going to check in. I'm just here. I've just got to sit here and think. And, and so this, yeah, I mean, there's a couple of thoughts about this. But first of all, we've got to hope it's slightly more serious note. We've got, we've got to hope that all of these people who are emailing us and reaching out to us, uh, you know, updating us on Facebook, and we've got to hope that they've all colluded together in a room privately to say, how am I going to use you, Jay, or me, Greg, how am I going to use that person at their highest point of contribution? We've got to hope that they have sort of come together to create this strategy for us. Because we are currently, the norm is that we are outsourcing, uh, you know, our the, the strategic function of our lives to email to these other people, and, and the risk here is that when we check email, we're checking somebody else's agenda. Yeah. And and so you know, this this is the stuff. Oh, we're going even more serious now, and we're riffing on this. This is the stuff that life regrets are made of. So, I mean, this is literally true. So let's just, just, just stay on this for a moment. That, I mean, we actually know quite a lot about people's regrets uh, when they, you know, on their deathbeds, because a lot of people have died. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of people spoke to other people before they did. Right. And so, we both you know, we, we both studied Ronnie Ware's. We both in both of our books found exactly the same resource, so. Ronnie Ware's book. I, yeah. So take us it, there. It, 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 yeah. And Bronnie Ware is, is, is a perfect illustration of the point. So what does she find is the number one regret of the dying? It's having lived a life based upon other people's social expectations rather than the internal voice of clarity you know, within us saying, this is the thing that you are built to do. This is what you must do with your one wild and precious life. All right. Now, what is striking to me about that is not just that it's a regret. It's that nobody ever intended to achieve that regret. No one ever set a goal to regret that. So it happened by default. 
and it happened because of social pressure. And so what I think is worth distinguishing is that we're not just in an age of information overload. That, that, that's fine, and, and maybe we are, but that's not the point. The point is that we're in a, a new era of opinion overload, where everybody is fighting for a piece of our, the mind share of us by going, here's my opinion, this is what I think you ought to do, this is what I'm doing. We're more aware of what the Joneses are doing by hundreds, thousands of people on Facebook, on, on Twitter, you know, etc. It just through email. And so all of these are acting upon us. And what I think is that the challenge has increased faster than our capability response has been. Oh, so it means that these people who regret these things are more likely, the chances are that this will increase over time, not decrease over time. Go ahead. You had a thought. Yeah, it's, it's one of the things that we looked at is this idea of work-life balance and this being overwhelmed, and it is an exponential growth and 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 how it's occurring in our lives, and it has corresponded with technology. Technology has broken down barriers, and and it's a wonderful thing. I don't want this to become a let's you know let's you know say bad things about some of these great tools, um, some of whom are built by your clients, right? But they have outpaced our ability to manage our attention, focus, and purpose through them. And when you were just saying email, like you, you gave categories. I mean, I think people play, you know, whatever, some game on their phone, or maybe they get on social media, or maybe they compulsively check their email. Um, there are all these things that we do that aren't critical. They're not moving a big agenda forward. And often, they're, as you described, we're turning our agenda over to someone else. And at South by Southwest, the year before you spoke, I got to hear this guy describe it, and he just said, I want you to start thinking of your email inbox as a time machine. You'll go in, and who knows when you'll come out. And you won't <laughs> know what you're doing until you do. Like, you open up email, and you look up, and it's an hour later, right? And you've not really done anything that day. And one of the central points when we talk to folks is figure out what you're supposed to do that day before you open the email. So that, that really resonated for me is that we've allowed things, maybe social pressure is a big part of it. We come into work, oh my gosh, what if the boss has sent me an email? To set our agendas versus having clarity for ourselves. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I just, just on this, I mean, okay, so I first of all agree, right? This, this, you don't have to be a Luddite uh, about, about technology. I mean, my view of technology is, is, is positive. Uh, but here's the here's the basic view: technology makes uh, you know for a great servant, but a poor master. Right. And uh, and and I mean, I was just talking to somebody, just uh, an organization, just within the last couple of weeks, and I, and I'm telling you, they there wasn't a person in the room when we really got into the discussion that believed that they could turn off their phone for even one minute in a 24-hour period in mm. a week. Not one minute. They believed, absolutely every person in that room believed, I have to have my phone with me 24-7. That's it. What, what advice, and, if, and, that, if that person's on this, what advice would you give them? I know you gave some great points in the book, but I, not to put you on the spot, but how can they maybe take that lie or myth and maybe flip it on its head and start maybe buying back some of their time? Well, I mean... First of all, uh, you know, you can have a policy, and this is what we ended up getting to, at least with this organization, with this culture that was so strong around phone dependency, where you could say, I will, be, I will have my phone on, but I'm not checking email between this time and this time. But if you need me, I'll be there. You can call me. So there was a, a complete availability, but at least it was now to the phone. Right. Uh, I mean, even that changes it significantly because it's the, it's the obsession to be checking the phone that causes the bigger problem, right? It's the checking on average, you know, I mean, we know this on average about 150 times, uh, you know, a day uh, people check their phones at the highest levels, it's like 900 times a day. I mean, this isn't, this isn't addiction light. This is just real addiction. Yeah, you uh, actually get dopamine burst in your brain, right? I mean, I've seen yeah, the science. <laughs> and, 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 but, but I'll tell you the thing that I really think is the fix. 
Uh, I mean, there's other people. I could give a few other thoughts. I mean, one of my, my business uh, partners uh, came to me once, and he just said, I just took email off my phone. Yeah. And my first reaction was like, <laughs> can you technically do that? I mean, no, 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 totally, just technically. And uh, uh, I mean, as it turns out, it's hard to actually really take email off your phone, but you can certainly disconnect to it. And what it means is that any time you think about checking your email, you have to remember you're doing it, and you can't do it just out of habit. So I, I think that is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And so I always disconnect my email on my phone whenever I'm back in and I'm back in town. When I'm traveling, I might put it back on because that has a lot of logical sense to me. I've taken off all of the apps off my phone other than those that are high utility uh, for me. Uh, so I'm constantly going through and clearing out any cluster. Uh, so this way, you're trying new things. You can be on the cutting edge of things, but you're not just becoming pulled into all the noise that's on your phone or on your desktop and so on. So. So I think those are some things. I so love that. You, I was going to say, yeah, just go to echo that, my good friend Ben and I were having this similar discussion about how vibrating and tinging phones right, are pulling our attention away from what was important. And he did exactly what you described. He just unhooked his email. And if he wanted to check his email, he had to go to the browser on his phone and log in to Gmail. So he added three steps so it wasn't reflexive. And he taught me, and it took me forever to do this, to get all of my notifications removed from my phone. So if I didn't manually yeah. pick it up to look at it, it would not entice me to do so. And that actually takes maintenance. But those are really simple strategies to maybe lower that frequency of those distractions. Yeah, I mean, I, I, all of that I just think is completely true. Let me just share one sort of broader um, but, but still tactical things that people can do to create space. So there's, there's all of this sort of moment to moment, what do you do on your phone, what do you do you know, with, with these kinds of things. But, but, the, it, but more broadly, the problem is, and there's some research that was just uh, discussed on NPR uh, about what we gave up when we got smartphones. So we know what we got, what we gained, there's a whole set of benefits, but what did we give up, what was the trade-off? It's long-term thinking and planning. Mm -hmm. right, so that is, that is directly proportionate, according to this research. That, that is the literal thing that society we have been giving up. I'm not sure that's a great trade-off, but nevertheless, that's there. So what do you do? And this is what I recommend. I think that people should schedule a personal quarterly off-site. Love so it. On that day, on that day, you are complete, and you schedule this up front. So this is, you know, you go on your calendar right now, you figure out approximately every 90 days, you schedule the whole day. On that day, you get completely away from the office. I mean, if, you're, if your company culture doesn't support it, if you're not an entrepreneur, maybe it has to be on, uh, on uh, you know, a Saturday or something. Uh, but you take a whole day. Uh, it's a very rejuvenating day, so the, the purpose is primarily a rejuvenation. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a space to think. Um, it's, you know, review the last 90 days. So it's sort of a rule of three here. It's like review the last three months, especially looking for what has been successful, what you've done well, what your achievements have been. Uh, then you look forward over the next three months, you say, okay, what are all the different things I could spend my time doing? What are some of the goals that I have? And then it's to eliminate and simplify that list until you find, okay, here are the big three. And you have them in priority order. And you say, these are the three things across my personal and professional life that I really want to achieve over the next three months. I love it. Uh, and, uh, it's I, a little I bit like treating yourself like a public a public company. You know, you've got your quarterly report you've got to deliver to yourself, and based on your earnings, right, your productivity, your production, you're going to move forward to the next level and and identify your next target. Breaks the year down into manageable pieces. Well, I think that's right, and 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 even though when we think about quarterly objectives in businesses, we often sort of decry this a little bit, like, hey, man, it's such short term thinking. We need longer term thinking. In people's lives, I actually find 90 days is, is longer term thinking than they are often doing uh, because of this minute to minute, text to text kind of culture that we're in. Uh, and so, uh, you know, 90 days becomes, you know, pretty powerful planning tool that you're not in the airy fairy land that you sometimes get into in mission statements that, you know, you, you can write them but nobody knows what they mean and you can't make any decisions based upon them. Um, this is very concrete, 
uh, and yet it also is a time in this one day every 90 days that you can reconnect with your long term, you know, your life goals as well. So you get to review those, uh, but also get it to be concrete. These are the three things in priority order that I want to achieve over the next three months. Well, you hit on it in, in your description there that, that step two, eliminate, right? You're narrowing things down. Um, how, do, how, do, how do people make that decision about what to say yes to and what to say no to? I'll give you a hint. Well, I would look, love it if you would talk about the 90% rule, which I thought was brilliant. Well, okay. Well, we'll let me we'll just spontaneously let's talk about the 90%. <laughs> uh, you know, the 90% rule is basically along the idea that, that people get caught in the middle. What does that mean? Uh, you know, if, if, an, if an opportunity comes your way that you just think, oh, that is a waste of time, that is not at all what I would love doing, uh, you know, that doesn't work for me. Well, that's fairly easy to say no to. And I say that, but I think people are actually such novices at no. That that can be tricky as well. The very fact somebody's asking you sometimes is just a good enough reason for doing it. Uh, and, and so, you know, but let's assume that we have a, enough, say, enough sort of awareness of ourselves, enough practice with, uh, with negotiating non-essentials that we can, can navigate those. But where we get caught up is when something is like a 60 or 70 or 80 percent yes, where you go, well, I mean, that's the kind of thing I like to do, and, uh, and I do like that person. Uh, but, so you don't feel great about it, but it feels pretty good. Right. And, that, and that's the trick, is that people can get so caught up in the pretty good that uh, there's no time for them to then really discern and really invest in the things that are absolutely great. And so uh, the, the, the practice is pretty simple, which is that you, you rate any option or opportunity or anything that you're thinking about doing on a scale of 1 to 10. And if it's not a 9 or 10 out of 10, or said differently, 90% or up to 100%, then you just strike it. You, you say it's just the same as a zero, and the answer is no. Is the way you describe and, and cleaning out a closet, right? If you don't love it, you need to give it away. You need to get it out of your closet because that's the best well, standard for what goes in there. Well, that, that's just so, so, so right. We can just talk about that for a moment, this idea of the closet. I mean, everybody on the call today, everybody on this, in this conversation knows what their closet looks like. You know what it looks like. And I know what it looks like. And here's what it looks like. You, you never really organize it. You never really get stuff out of it. And yet somehow, magically, the only the things you absolutely love and wear often, you know, pristinely organized, that's what remains. Uh, you know, right? Yeah, uh, not yeah. so much. <laughs> no, not so much. Right? Of course not. Because what really happens is that, is that people give you clothes, right? You know, maybe right. this to give you, your brother gives you some clothes and time or whatever. So you get something passed to you and it, and then you bought something because it was on sale at some point. You didn't love it, but it was okay. Or then maybe you bought something you used to love it, but you know you don't fit it anymore, right? For one one reason or another, or it's out of fashion now. And so actually, what you've got is this this sort of uh, overloaded closet. And then every so often you think, well, maybe I'm going to go and clear it out today. You know, it's just time. I'm fed up with it. And uh, and you go to take something off the shelf. And in the moment that you go to take it off the shelf, something Something odd happens. You know, if you ever had this experience, Jay, you, you go to take it off, and then in the moment of taking it off, it it, it suddenly seems to increase in value in some way. <laughs> and you and you think, well, the nostalgia of this thing, or yeah, the, yeah. exactly, the nostalgia comes in. Oh, you know, I might wear it again sometime. That's part, I mean, you know, and it, it it's, it's all right. It's not. It's not. And then it goes back on the shelf. Now there's a, a term for this. And the term for this is the endowment effect. And the endowment effect is a generally, a broadly positive idea. And, and the endowment effect is why people look after, you know, homes that they own, right? If you own your house, you treat it better than if you don't own it. So ownership makes you care about it. You're, it's been endowed to you, so it has a certain effect upon you. It also explain, explains why nobody in the history of the whole world has washed their own rental car. <laughs> um, you know, because you don't own it, it's somebody else's problem. Uh, but, but here's where it gets tricky, is where we, 
overvalue something beyond its real value to us simply because we own it. And that's what happens with these clothes in the closet. And that's furthermore, that's what happens with the closet of our lives. Right. Is that because we have an opportunity, because something has come our way, because we've done it in the past, we just keep on doing it. Mm. And, uh, and, and so what we have to do, whether it's clothes, uh, metaphorical clothes, or whether it's the, clo- you know, the, the opportunity, the actual opportunity in our lives, we have to put ourselves in the position of not owning it. So it's a little trick to, to take on this brain heuristic, this problem. And the trick is, what, how hard would I work for this opportunity if it hadn't already come to me? Hmm. How much would I pay for this item of clothing today if you're I didn't just, own it? You're changing how the perspective. Would, I love it. You, you are to the point of not owning it. And, and this cures us of, uh, you know, largely of this problem. And, uh, and so this is a step towards this idea that we, we were just wrestling with now of, of elimination. This permission not to keep doing it, whether it's law school for me, whether it's uh, somebody's come to you and asked you to, to, to take on a new project at work, uh, you know, uh, whether it's uh, a, new, a new commitment at school, your kids come home from school and they've got, oh, they want to do chess club, right? And, and, and you think, well, that's a good thing. <laughs> you know, maybe I should maybe maybe I should do it if it's good. Good is insufficient criteria for today's environment. Right. That is such an important idea is that we we have to to, to put, present extreme criteria now to selecting only you know ninety percent and above. That's the ninety percent rule. Well, I, I want to share with you a success story, and it, it, it relates to both of our books, but I think methodolo- uh, through methodology yours. I talked to an entrepreneur, and I'd been introduced to him because I was talking to a friend in a coffee shop, and I was saying that I was going to interview you, and he goes, wow, that's weird. One of my good friends just sold his business after reading both of your books. I was like, really? He goes, yeah, you got to talk to him. And here's what he shared with me. He had, this is a very big, famous seven-figure company, but I don't want to share without his permission the name. But he said he developed three criteria, right? After reading the one thing and asking, what's the one thing I can do, right? And then clearly was using the 90% rule. He said he looked at his company. He had a new child, you know, and we get clarity. We get space to think sometimes then. And he said, does this rate a nine in terms of how I manage my stress? Does it rate a nine or above in terms of my impact on the world? And does it rate a nine or above in terms of profit? And his three things are stress, impact, and profit. Those are his three criteria for saying yes. And he goes, I could could argue. I love it. I got chill bumps. And I was like, he said, I could argue. And I fought with myself trying to laying up all night, literally justifying how they could be nines. But the reality (laughs) was, is they weren't. (laughs) They weren't, and he yeah. the hard truth. Yeah. So he sold his company, and he started a new one that's in perfect alignment with those three criteria. He wants less stress. He wants to have more impact on other people's lives. And obviously, he's a business person. He wants to have profit, and he's looking for all nines. And I just thought, wow, well, there it is. That's like that's that's that is the best endorsement for how someone could get clarity. Use your book. I'm now going to establish my simple criteria for a yes. And then they, he lived it in a huge way. Well, and, and as you hear the story, at least for me, I don't have any fear for this man. No. Like, no. I, I don't feel, of course, he's just taken what at some level is this huge, I mean, certainly a huge step, but, but the implication could also be this huge risky step. But does it feel risky? to eliminate something that's clearly not a nine out of 10 for you and instead to pursue only those things that meet those three criteria. Uh, I, I mean, certainly in the long run, I mean, is he, is he going to regret, you know, come back to this idea of on, on one's deathbed? Will he get on his deathbed? Is he going to say, oh my goodness, I just wish I had stayed pursuing the, the six, seven, and eight out of 10 for me. I just wish I hadn't pursued nine or above out of 10. I could have been in the rat race a little bit longer, you know? Yeah. Exactly. No. Exactly. And this isn't going to happen. This isn't, this isn't going to be our regret. Oh, I just can't believe I became an essentialist and focused on what was really essential for me and instead just got pulled into all of the non-essential things from other people. No, it's, not, it's not true. 
But but I think what's important here is to make the connection between the first discipline of what is essential and the second of eliminating, right? It, 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 I didn't write a book called Noism. <laughs> I, I didn't write a book about saying no. Now, there is a whole chapter on the graceful no, how to say a graceful no, and that is eight an important great skill. strategies. I don't know that we have time unless it comes up in a question yeah. for us, but you have eight. People need to go buy the book and read that. There were great eight very graceful ways to say no without and, and sidestep the political pressure and all of that. Yeah, and, and, and so the connection, though, is you've got to actually get to clarity first. And the clarity is, in my view, the beginning of all empowerment. Yes. And I think that's true for, for individuals. I think that's true for teams and for whole organizations. The clarity is the beginning of all empowerment. And so this is why creating space to figure out that first is always the first thing to do. Once we have it, then the problem isn't solved. Now we've got to work out what to do with all the other things that we have. Now, some of those things will be, you say, okay, they, they, they are essential, but they're not yet. I'm going to show discipline. You know, this is like Apple, uh, you know, choosing to stop work on the iPad so that they could get the iPhone out. Right. I mean, that's amazing, right? I mean, that, they, they, no, no other companies in Silicon Valley through that period was showing that kind of discipline. HP, for example, had a whole, they had a touch computer that they released. And there are still people, employees at HP that don't know they had that product. So <laughs> that's amazing, right? They had it, they launched it, and it's been discontinued, and the whole company itself doesn't know. Right? So, so compare that to Apple, this, this idea that, okay, some things you're just not going to do yet. They're right, but not yet. Okay, that's one thing. A second thing, of course, is a very important role for delegation. I, I mean, I, 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 essentialists in my research are simply better delegated. In fact, they have a kind of extreme view of empowerment, which is, look, if it isn't the very best use of me, I'm already looking for someone else to do it. Uh, you know, obviously, depending where someone is in their in their career or in their business, affects how much they can uh, they, they can delegate to others. Uh, but uh, but 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 here's uh, here's here's I think the, the the delegation idea is you simply ask uh, you know if I had sufficient resources what would I delegate right uh, so that you start to have a sense of which of these things are not essential are not the the highest and best use of me and and bit by bit I think this is the the beginning is looking for people that love that stuff looking mm -hmm. for people that want to take on that project so that you can focus on the things that that really matter. And then, of course, there's a third category, which is things you actually are just going to say no to. Right. They shouldn't be done by you. They shouldn't be done by somebody else within your sphere. And, and, and then the, the key is, is to be able to be as upfront as it is possible and to be, uh, and to be, and to be able to do it uh, wisely and carefully, uh, gracefully. And so as we already talked about this a chapter specifically on that. Well, you know, we're going to have to. We're getting close to the end of our hour, and I'm sure some folks have maybe blocked out a late lunch or something, and they'll have to be, you know, getting back, taking the headphones off and getting back to work if they're actually in an often setting. Can you quickly, like, give us the, the quick, the, the last step is execute. We kind of hit on that on some levels. What's funny is if you eliminated the stuff out of the way and you're clear about where you're going, that last step feels a little bit like the momentum's already going there, but... Can you hit us with one piece of wisdom, and then we'll try to take a few questions um, from the audience before we have to wrap this up? Yes, this is simply the idea of resource reallocation. Every CEO has a primary problem before everything else, which is resource allocation. They have finite resources, infinite number of ways of, uh, of utilizing those resources, and so do we as the CEO of our own lives have the same problem. And so the, you know, what we're talking about when we get to execution is simply taking those resources that we have now, uh, you know, saved, and that we now can reallocate because we're not utilizing them on the things that we would have done. And we simply take those and we put them on the things we've identified as essential projects for this three months. And by doing that, we massively increase the chance of us succeeding with it. In fact, the goal is, it's a high aspiration goal, is how, how can we make it frictionless to achieve it, effortless to achieve it? because we've built the platform to make it uh, happen. Uh, so, you know, you can build a routine that eventually becomes, as you mentioned at the beginning, habitual uh, and, uh, and, and in a sense effortless because you just, this is what you do every single morning. 
Uh, this is what you do every single afternoon, and you've built a system that just works, uh, rather than trying to force execution at the last moment, as non-essentialists tend to do. Well, thank you. I love that. I'm going to ask Ian, who's been monitoring the questions, to join us. I'm going to mute myself, and Greg, I'm going to let him ask you a couple of questions. We're probably going to limit it to two or three. I'll let Ian make the call, and then um, I'll invite you to say any last words of wisdom before we part ways with our crowd. So, Ian, why don't you jump on, and let's curate a couple of great questions from the audience. Sure. Sure. Uh, uh, so, uh, Greg, the, um, the first question we have here that is interesting is, uh, uh, Gilles asks, what's your perspective on anxiety by choosing the one thing, like thinking about the other opportunities and knowing that you have more talents and strengths, but how, how do you focus on what's essential? Oh, I'm not sure I understood that question. Can, can you just give me a little bit more about that? Yeah, so basically, how, how can you focus on what's essential when you know that you might have other things that you also have a strength? Oh, okay, so you're trying to say, how do you, contra how do you discern between, you, you, yes, what you're describing, I think, is the curse of capability. Right. Right, that, that you can do far more things than you actually have time and resources to do. Uh, you, you know, you've got the talent, and, and I think I would just say it this way, right? There's, there's three elements to this. There are strengths is important. You ought to know your strengths, but you're not just looking for what you're good at. You're saying, you know, what can, what can I be incredibly good at, right? That's, a, that's one way to discern between a variety of strengths. The second is that you've got to combine it with what you're passionate about, and also what, uh, what, what need you want to serve in the world, what, what contribution you want to make. So I think those together create three questions uh, that help us to select between all the different uh, opportunities in the closet of our lives. Thank you. So um, another one here is um, somebody is asking about, is there a fine line between a no and just plain self selfishness, this person says, or self-indulgence. Uh, she's talking about actually family gatherings, uh, about the fact that, you know, um, sometimes she wants to miss them, but then she feels guilty about them. Does this apply to family too, Greg? Oh, that, that, that's just fantastic. I read something recently that just said, family is hard, hard, hard. That was the end of what they had to say about it. Uh, look, look here, here, here's the thing. Um, the, the book is about essentialism, essential. What is essential? Now, that is a very personal question. What is essential? Uh, I mean, I tend to think that, that one way to, to test whether something's essential is who will be, you know, in, at my deathbed, right, literally. Who is in the room? And, and, and typically, the answer to that is family in some form or another. And so I think that becomes the first group of people that you say, those are the people I'm going to focus on. Uh, those are the people that I'm going to prioritize. The other people will come and go in my life, but those people you know, are essential. I, I, I mean, I find that, um, that, that sometimes people do worry about that saying no is being selfish, but I think it's just two different questions. You, know, you can say yes and be selfish, you can say no and be selfish. Uh, I, I think that, that there's a way that no is a very selfless thing. If you are saying no to things that are uh, that, that will um, take you away from your highest point of contribution. So the preliminary question is, you know, what is your highest point of contribution? And if you know that, and you know that doing this thing that's before you will take you away from that highest point of contribution, then you shouldn't do it. You have an obligation not to do it. It's not selfish, that's selfless so that you can invest your energies in the things that absolutely, uh, you know, matter most. All right, Greg, that, that's the great answer. Thanks so much. I, um, we, we're reaching the end of our webinar. We really appreciate you uh, being as a guest. Uh, it's been great information. I, I, I would like for you to, uh, if, if people want to ask their questions, uh, they have the Twitter uh, account and they can uh, write to you if that's okay. Um, so, uh, do you have uh, any other words, Jay, to say? Let me unmute myself. Um, no, I just want to say thanks again. 
for coming on board and really appreciated your giving so much time and energy to us. And we'll look on social media for any extra questions before I hand it off to you to take us to the end. Thanks again, Greg. Thank you ever so much, Jay. Thank you. Bye for now. All right, folks, uh, just to finish off here, you have there on your screen our uh, link for a free personal workbook. Uh, this is going to be uh, something that you can apply today using the uh, learnings from the session today. So make sure you write that down and go and grab your uh, free personal workbook. Um, and now the next steps is uh, we always have a, a survey. We ask you to please uh, take it. It'll just take you two minutes, two to three minutes, but it will provide good feedback for next time. Uh, look for an email within 24 hours hours that email will contain a link to the recording of this webinar um, and also a, a link to this personal workbook that we're offering uh, for the free download. Um, you can check out all our archive uh, different webinars that we have at that link right there. If you write it down, we have six webinars next week. We'll be adding today. So there'll be seven webinars that you can go and listen for free. And finally, uh, mark that in your calendars that next webinar is next month on Thursday, June the 25th at this same time, 3 p.m. Finally, you have our social media handles there. Uh, we are at the one thing. If you want to tweet to Jay, he's at Jay Papazan. You can follow Greg at uh, Gregory McKeon. And then make sure to continue our conversation if you have questions regarding this topic using the hashtag the one thing and uh, visit our website too at the one thing.com again thank you for attending we really appreciate it and have a great uh, memorial weekend